Amen. Well, we want to welcome everybody to uh, our second service of the day, but most especially, we want to take a moment and welcome anyone who might be with us for the very first time. If this is your first visit to our church, we would love to give you a proper and a warm welcome, and you would assist us by just kindly raising your hand and letting us know who you are. We're not going to embarrass you in any way. We simply have a packet of information that we would like to share with you. Is there anyone here for the very first time today, first time guest? Welcome way back there. Welcome, welcome, welcome on that side as well. Somebody up in the balcony, welcome. Good to see you up there as well. A big shout out to all of our first time guests. I am Pastor Ray, the very happy to be pastor of this awesome church. And on behalf of the Living Word family, we do welcome you to our service today. So thank you for your visit. We want to welcome our internet audience as well. So whether you're here in the sanctuary or watching by internet, we're all unified together in the spirit of Christ. So let's put our hands together and welcome everybody that's participating once again. All right. So I just want to let you know a little bit of what's going on. So now we've completed the multipurpose room, but as I have explained, right, as I have explained, it hasn't really been totally paid for yet, right? So let me give you an update as to where we are. We took in $5,120.50 this week. So we are uh, total collected so far $440,644.85. So we're, yep, go ahead, put your hands together. We have $559,355.15. I don't know how we keep getting these like little cents at the end, but um, I guess people are throwing some change in there, but that's all right. We'll take it. We'll take the children give. That's right. So we'll take every, every bit, every penny counts. So now this is what I want to let you know. All right. So we're still trying to raise that million dollars, but I'm looking around the building and I'm seeing that every square inch of this building has been remodeled since we initially opened this building back in um, May of 2000, right? So it's 24 years ago. We've done minor stuff, but in the last couple of years, we've basically revamped this whole building, put a whole new addition, you know, put a brand new roof, redid all the siding, the gutters, everything is brand new. There's only two rooms in this place that haven't been touched that are original 24 years ago, and that's the men's room and the ladies' room. So I made the decision to bite the bullet and to remodel, we're gonna begin the process of remodeling those two rooms as well. So both bathrooms are gonna be ripped out and remodeled, and you're gonna love it because we've already picked out the tile and all the toilets and everything's gonna be brand new, spanking new. Um, and so that's gonna add about another $130,000. I'm not gonna raise what we're trying, the amount that we're trying to raise. We're gonna keep it at a million, but I need your help. I wanna get this project underway. I wanna get those, and we're gonna have to do it quickly. Otherwise, you're gonna have to <laughs> hold yourself. I'm going to have to preach real fast and get you in and get you out of here. <laughs> All right. So we got a plan. You may not like the plan, but we got a plan if, if it takes a little long to raise the money. But we got a plan. All right. We'll have some outhouses out there, you know, those little porta potties. And we'll, we'll do whatever we got to do, right? Come on, everybody give me an amen. All right. All kidding aside, we're going to go as fast as we can. We're going to rip them out and put them back together. We're hoping we're going to get it done in a week um, on each bathroom, maybe two weeks. Um, we're going to see, but we'll come up with a plan, and I'll let you know. But that project will get underway. We just need to get permits from the city, and we're already in that process. Make sure we have everything lined up, and then we're going to be remodeling those two bathrooms. Don't you just love it? Don't you just love, you know, and make it fresh and clean? and uh, looking good. So I need your help. I need your continued support of the building fund. So if you've given, give again. Consider giving again. Let's keep it going. We're almost at the half a million dollar mark. We're almost halfway there. We can do it. T say this with me. Say, together, together. We, will we will do it. Say, together, together. We, will do it. we will do it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Everybody put your hands together and give God the praise and the glory. All right. So, if you're giving to the building fund and you're doing it by envelope the old-fashioned way, then you'll do it with this envelope that has the building picture on it. And all these envelopes are in the f behind the chair in front of you. And then, um, more than conquerors radio. Please don't forget that. We're reaching lots of people all over the country, 10 radio stations. We want to keep this going. So if everybody does a little towards that, it would be a great help. And then, of course, our regular tithe. Everybody say tithe. 
you've been around here in the last six months, you know I've been talking about the principles of prosperity. It all begins with tithes and offerings and it works its way down from there. How many of you here last weekend when Dr. Barkley was here? How many of you were here, right? Was that awesome about tithers' rights? Powerful, <coughs> tithers' rights. So you have, a, you have tithers' rights. If you weren't here, you ought to go back and listen to it because it was very powerful. The rights that you have because you are a tither, because you bring your tenth to the Lord, you are protected and you can call upon God. Uh, the Bible says in Malachi, it's built, built upon those verses, Malachi chapter three, where it says, he will rebuke the devourer for your sake. He will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Talked about how Vicky got healed of cancer, rebuking the devourer for your sake. How his granddaughter was, uh, was basically, she drowned, but she came back to life. And she was underwater for quite a while, whatever it was, but she told the whole story. You want to listen to it, she came back to life because they called upon tithers' rights and you have those rights too if you are a tither. And you can count on God to come through for you in Jesus' name and everyone who agrees says amen. Let's stand up, let's stand to our feet, let's lift up our offerings to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give and to sow into the kingdom for the purposes of kingdom building. We bring our tithes, our offerings, our gifts of love, and we release them into this house, that there might be food, meat, and provision in this house to carry out all of the plans and purposes you have set forth for Living Word Christian Church. As we do so, we do it in faith, standing upon your principles and promises that teach us to give, and it shall be given unto us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men pour into our bosom, and with the same measure that we use, it shall be measured to us again and again in the awesome, the matchless, and the wonderful name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone who agrees says, Amen. Let's receive this offering, if you will. So I'm going back over a message. Of course, you say, oh, geez, here he goes again, going to repeat himself. I don't repeat myself because I'm old, and I, re you know, that's not the reason why I repeat myself. I'm not old anyway, but... Uh, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Not old. I'm getting better. But because I'm older, it's not because I'm, I'm repeating myself, but these are messages that I believe the Lord has burned in my heart to encourage you with. And we need to hear some things over and over again. If you're, I don't know if you're anything like me. Some people are. Maybe you're not. But I need to hear things over and over again um, to help me to really understand. So this is a message that I did. I checked my notes. It's been about six or seven years, so it'll be a refreshing for some of you, but it will be a first time sowing for some of you as well. So today I want you to open with me. We're going to start in Mark's Gospel, chapter no, number nine. We want to be in Mark's Gospel, chapter nine. And uh, the title of this message and this is not an original. This was a message that I heard many, many years ago by a great man of God. And I thought, wow, this is so good. I got I to gotta take this as my own and develop this into my own message. And not all of my stuff is original, you know. Um, if I hear a good message, I'll take it and I'll use it um, because it's all the Holy Ghost anyway, right? So it all comes from the Holy Spirit. So the title of this message is, and now listen, because this is important, the impossible becomes possible when you do what is possible. The impossible becomes possible when you do what is possible. And so many times people are just paralyzed because, you know, they're waiting for God to do something. And, uh, you know, uh, in a position of waiting for God to do something and feel like there is nothing that they can do. But that is not correct. You see, I think a lot of times God is waiting for us to do something because it's when we move in faith that God begins to move in correspondence to, you know, corresponding to our faith. He will move upon your situation, your circumstances, or whatever it be. So you move first, and then God corresponds with blessing you, increasing you, doing whatever it is that you are seeking God for. So a lot of times people put themselves in this position of just waiting and really not doing anything and paralyzed, feeling that things are hopeless or nothing will ever change or this can't happen or that can't happen. And I'm telling you, the impossible is very possible when you first do what is possible. And we'll see that from the, from the scriptures today. So I want to start with Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. And <clears throat> I'm just going to read through this. 
And let's lay this down. Um, Verse 14, Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 14. And when he, Jesus, came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately, when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one in the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Notice that this gentleman in the crowd understood that this was a spiritual problem, that he was confronted with a demon of some sort. Um, Every sickness, every disease has its origin in a demonic force. God is not the author of sickness. He's not the author of disease. Do not put the blame at God's feet. Put it at the enemy's feet where it belongs. So this man recognized and understood that this was a demonic uh, attack upon his son. And he spoke to, to to the disciples, but they could not do it. And he answered him in verse um, verse 19. He answered him and said, now listen to how Jesus responds to this. Now, now this guy is hopeless. This guy has no hope. He's helpless. He's been all over trying to get help, and he can't. And he's pleading with Jesus to help him. And look, look at the response that Jesus gives him. He says, oh, faithless generation. And he probably didn't say it in a very, you know, uh, calm way. He was probably a little perturbed about it. He said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? So he's almost like a little irritated by it, by the lack of faith, by the lack of the disciples, and maybe this man as well, using their faith to see this thing rectified and healed and this demon driven from this little boy's life. So how long shall I bear with you? Then they brought him to him, And when they saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. So obviously this little boy, who wasn't a little boy, he was probably an older teenager or maybe a young teenager, because this has been happening to him from childhood. So he was helpless. He was hopeless. He was looking all over the place for some sort of help. And look at what Jesus does. And he says in verse, well, first he says in verse 22, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. Now listen to what the the man says. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. So here this man again is looking all over the place for help. He's going here and there and everywhere to try to find somebody to help him. And we don't know who else he had been to. We don't know elsewhere that he might have been, but he's looking for help. And listen to what Jesus says. He comes to Jesus and he says, if you can do something, have compassion on us and help us. Now listen to what Jesus says. I love this. Jesus looks at him and says, if you believe all things are possible to him who believes. I like the way the, I'm sorry, the Amplified Version says it. The Amplified Version says it this way. And Jesus said, you say to me, if I can do anything? Why? All things can be, are possible to him who believes. So Jesus, instead of immediately answering the question, you know, saying, okay, bring it to me, let me heal him. He did ultimately heal him. He did ultimately drive out the demon. But he flips it to him and he says, you ask me if I can do anything? Of course, you know, it's like a silly question. You're asking the son of God if he can do, of course he can do something. You're asking me if I can do anything? Well, I'm saying to you, don't you know that all things, all things are possible to him who believes? Why would you ask me that? You ask me if I can do anything. Why, don't you understand? Don't you know that all things are possible to him who has faith, to him who stands believing? Why would you ask me that question? He, he says it before, faithless generation. He's addressing the lack of faith, the lack of trust in the living God. He said, don't you know that he who believes, he who has faith, he who trusts God, 
all things become possible to him. Notice he says all things are possible, not just the easy things, not just the simple things, not just the things that, you know, are insignificant. He said all things are possible to him who believe, him who has faith, him who stands trusting the living God, all things become possible. That means that nothing should ever be impossible to a Christian. We should never look at anything as an impossible situation. Unfortunately, we're in a world that's so riddled with doubt, so riddled with a lack of faith, so riddled with fear, so riddled with all of these things that are in the world that often it gets on us as Christians and it hinders and it stops our true believing God for all of these impossible things that could be possible if we would just use our faith, throw off the fear, throw off the worry, throw off the lack of faith, and begin to believe God and thank God for that which seems impossible. The impossible becomes possible. The impossible becomes possible when you do what is possible. I look over my life when I first started this church Everything seemed like an impossibility. It wasn't a probability. I was uneducated. I just had a high school education. Didn't go to cemetery. I mean the seminary. <laughs> I, didn't, I, did, <laughs> I didn't go to Bible school. But yet I felt that I had this call of God on my life and this passion within me that burned day and night. I couldn't drive it away. I tried to run away from it, but the, the harder I tried to run away from it, the stronger it got in my life. And I would come before God and say, God, how can you use somebody like me? First of all, I'm, 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 I'm no college education, no Bible school. I'm not a married man. Every pastor has a wife. She leads, you know, the worship usually. She leads the women's group. I don't have that. And, you know, I gave my whole list of reasons why I could not be called, you know, I could not be used by God in the ministry. And the more I came up with my list of impossibilities, the, the stronger the call and the stronger the draw to ministry became in my life. I was looking at all the impossibilities. I had the vision of a brand new building and being in a brand new facility somewhere in a, in a, in a very prominent location. We had nothing. We were just a little church with 50 people at that time, and I had a big vision burning on the inside of me. It seemed impossible that it would never happen. But I grabbed hold of these verses and verses like them. With God, all things are possible. You see, see, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Uh, this, this verse here, you save me if I can do anything. All things are possible to him who believes. If you will activate your faith, if you will just release your faith, all things become possible in your life. Nothing should ever seem impossible to you because God will back you up when you stand firmly in faith and trust and belief. It's really learning to trust him and to throw off the fear because fear is a demon and fear wants to torment you and fear wants to hold you back and fear wants to rob you of your faith. But yet the words of the Savior still ring clear, loud and clear, all things, all things. All things are possible to one who believes. All things are possible to one who has simple, childlike faith, trusting God every step of the way. This has been the story of my life. I, haven't, I wasn't even prepared to step into ministry. I wasn't even prepared to do the things that God would put before me. But I just trusted him with childlike faith. Just said, Lord, with you, with you, all things are possible. With you and my faith working, all things are possible. You see, the impossible becomes possible when you start to do what's possible. You take the little bit that you have and you do something with it and God will come on it and turn it into a miracle in your life. How many of you can say amen to that? Amen. So immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, please help my unbelief. And uh, 
Jesus saw the people running. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, You deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and to enter him no more. And the spirit cried out with a loud voice and left that child. But you see, the lesson here is that what Jesus was trying to teach is that all things, you can do this yourself. You don't need me. You can do this yourself with your faith. If you unleash your faith, all things become possible. That which seems impossible, you, you begin to realize, you begin to see, when I do what's possible, if I just do what I can do with a little bit of faith that I have and rest in Jesus and let God do his part, you begin to see the impossible start to happen in your life. Can I get a better amen than that? I want to go over to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. I want to relate a little story, and this is such a powerful story, about how the impossible becomes possible when you do what's possible. And in Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, and verse 30, then the apostles, verse 30 says, the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all the things, both what they had done and what they had taught. They had been out in the ministry circuit. They'd been out ministering and teaching and ministering to people, and Jesus said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. They had been tired from ministry. I understand what that is. You know, you, you start giving out all the time, and sometimes you just got to take a rest and, and refresh and, and take some in. And I'm about to do that over this summer, all right? So if I'm not around, don't get upset. I'm just resting a while like Jesus did with his disciples. I'm going to rest a while and get refreshed, all right? So... Come, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they, and I understand how that is, because sometimes we get that busy, we don't even have time to eat. So they de de uh, departed to a deserted place in a boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them, and came together to him. So they saw that Jesus was taking off for a certain location. They knew where he was headed. They went and got other people, and they ran to see Jesus at this location. And Jesus is in the boat with his disciples trying to get some rest. But yet the people still thronged him and wanted him and needed him. And in verse 34, and Jesus, when he came out of the boat, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. So Jesus being a shepherd and having a shepherd's heart, put his own vacation time aside and tended to the sheep that were before him, and he began to teach them many things. So he must have been teaching for a long time, because verse 35 says, when the day was now far spent. See, some of you get irritated because I preach for 50 minutes maybe, 45 minutes, and you're like looking at your watch, you're looking around because you want to get it. Jesus preached the whole day. They were just sitting there listening to him, and nobody squawked. <laughs> they just drew from Jesus. They drew from the anointing that was on him. So when the day was now far spent, when the disciples came to him and said, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding countries and villages and buy themselves some bread, for they have nothing to eat. So now they were sitting there all day and they were listening to Jesus preach. So now you have some hungry people. We actually call them, they're hungry, but they're getting angry. We call them hangry. <laughs> they're hangry because they're getting ugly now. Did you ever get around somebody when they're hungry? They get a little nippy and snippy because they're, they're hungry and they, they want to eat. Well, this is what was happening. So the crowd is listening, but now they're getting a little grouchy because they're hungry and they have no food. And of course, they're going to the disciples. They're going to the ushers. And they're saying, you know, fix this problem. We're hungry. Don't you have any food around here? Help us. We need to eat. And, um, and uh, so the disciples, of course, what they do, the ushers, what they do is when the people start complaining and they don't know what to do, they come to the leader, just like they come to me. And the pastor, the people are complaining. So they come to Jesus, they say, Jesus, they're complaining, they're hangry, they want to eat. And their answer to it is, send them away, Lord. Get up and just tell them to go away and go buy food somewhere in the city and let them take care of themselves 
because we don't have enough food to feed them. We don't have enough money to buy the food to feed them because they say to, we don't have it. Jesus turns to them and says, he answers and said to them, you give them something to eat. You, see, Jesus begins to challenge them. He said, you do something about the problem. So, and they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? So you see, they said 200 denarii worth of bread, according to what I could find out, is about six months worth of labor in that day. So they probably didn't have it, or if they did have it, he's asking them, he said, what, you want us to go and buy all of this food and try to feed all these people? So Jesus turns to them and he says, he says, how many loaves do you have? What do you have? He says, go and see. Obviously, they, they didn't know. He said, go and see what you have. And he begins to challenge them. So they're running around in the crowd and they're taking an assessment and they're looking you know, here and there and everywhere to try to find what's there. They did act in obedience. I give them credit for acting in obedience to Jesus' command. They probably said, the master just said, go find, go find what we have. So they're going around asking people, and when they came back, they found out and they said, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, as we read the story down, you're going to find out that there's 5,000 people in this group. It says 5,000 men, to be exact, in, in, in this verse. 5,000 men, that's not counting the women and the children. Comes back and he said, well, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. And, and, and what do you want us to do? You see, there's a big need but a very small provision. There's a big need, but a small provision. And you see, a lot of us, you know, we see the big need, and we may have a small provision to meet that need, but I'm here to tell you, we're going to see in these verses that it may seem like an impossible situation, but the impossible becomes possible when you start to do what's possible, and that's what Jesus is teaching them here. Go find out what you have. You see, most of the time, we look at what we don't have. We're always looking at the negative side of things. If I only had this, if I only had that. If I had this, I would do that. If I had that, I'd do this. If I was this, I would be that. You, 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 we're always looking at the negative side of things, and we wonder why we can't get anywhere. Instead of looking at what we don't have, we not, need to start to look at what we do have. Thank you for that one amen. That's really encouraging this morning. I said we have to start looking at what we do have. Because every one of us has something. Every one of us is in a much better position than you think you are. He told him, go and look. Sometimes you've got to look within yourself to see what you got. Sometimes you've got to hunt deep and far and wide, deep within your own soul and your own being to see what you got on the inside. Because I'm going to tell you what, you've got a whole lot more than you think you've got. Even if it seems like a little, and it may be a big, a big need, but it looks like a small provision, let me tell you what, God ain't finished with you yet. God ain't finished with you yet. Stop short-circuiting your faith by looking at the need instead of looking at what you have. Look at the seed, not the need. Go find out, he says, what you've got. Let me see. Go rummage around this crowd of people. Do a little census and bring back something. Give me something to work with because you put something in my hands, the Lord says, and I'll make something out of nothing. I'll make something out of nothing. So they come back and they report and they say, five loaves and two fish. Ha, what are you going to do with that, Jesus? thinking that they probably trapped the Lord like, what are you going to do now? How are you going to, what are you going to do with five loaves of bread and two fish? Let me tell you what, man, let me tell you what, you haven't seen yet what God can do with just a couple of little things that you have in your life. You haven't seen yet how God can make something out of just a little bit that you have. When you use your faith and you trust, the impossible becomes possible when you do what is possible. And the problem is, too many of us are always focused on the impossible instead of the possible. Impossible. This can't be. It'll never happen to me. You're operating in the spirit of doubt and unbelief, and Jesus addresses you when he addressed 
that, that the disciples in that previous verse we spoke about, he called them faithless generation. How long must I be with you, ye faithless generation? God wants to stimulate our faith. He wants to see us begin to rise up with our faith and trust him with a radical faith that refuses to be denied and knows that God is the God of great miracles in our life. Come on, somebody give me a better amen than that. So he said to him, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. They came back and they said, five loaves and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. Now you got hungry people. You got his top men totally confused about what's going on. They're looking at just a few little loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And he's telling them, go sit them down. In, in groups of 50, and I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that they're just acting in faith, saying, I don't know what the Lord's going to do. The Master's going to do something here because, because I, I don't understand this. We only have a little bit. Sit them down. Get them into groups. So he sat them down in groups. So they sat down in ranks of hundreds and fifty. So he put some in groups of hundreds, some in groups of 50. He laid them all out, got them all. Or, see, God likes organization. See how he, he put them in groups? hundreds and fifties, got them all, right? See, before there's going to be miracles, signs and wonders, and demonstrations of the Spirit, we've got to have order. That's just a little side note. You've got to have order. If you want to see God work and you want to see God move, we've got to have order in the house. He didn't like this order. He set them up in fifties and set them up in ranks in fifties and hundreds. And this is what Jesus does. In verse 41, he says, And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he took whatever he had. He looked up to heaven. He blessed it and broke the loaves and gave it to his disciples to set before the people. So he's taking what he has and he's not even paying attention to the big need. Rather, he's looking to the big need maker, the one who, the one who meets the need, the, the big need meter, is what I need to say. He's looking up to heaven. He's got the five loaves, the two fish, and he begins to break it, and he's not even paying attention to anything around him. When you're going to, listen, when you're standing in faith and you're, you're, you want to see a miracle, you got to tune out everything around you. you got to tune out all of the naysayers, all of the unbelievers, all of the fear. you got to tune out all of the unbelief. you got to tune out all of the, what the devil says, what people say, you got to tune it out. All you do is you take what you got and you offer it up to God. And you say, Lord, it doesn't seem like it's enough, but you are the God that's more than enough. You are the El Shaddai, the God that is more than enough. So, Father, I just honor you and I thank you. And he's just praising God and he's blessing God and he's blessing and he's breaking and he's breaking and he's breaking and he's handing it to his disciples. And all of a sudden, what he's holding in his hand starts to multiply. He took something, he took nothing and he turned it into something. You see, that's what you have to do with your faith. Take what you have, offer it up to God, and begin to bless God for what you have. Don't complain about what you don't have. Say, thank you, God, for what I'm holding in my hand. I lift it up to you, and I honor you, and I begin to break it, and I begin to offer it up to you. And all of a sudden, the impossible becomes possible because you're doing what is possible. You see, you're not the miracle worker. God is. All you're called to do is to stand in a place of faith. Use what you've got. Man, I, I had to do that in those early days. Just had to use what I had. We didn't have much. I got a big dream and a little church. I see, you know, a big room like this filled with people, and I got a room a quarter of this size filled with half the amount, you know, just half full. But inside, I've got a big vision burning. So what do you do when you're in a place like that? You have a big vision, a big desire, a big need. Maybe you've got a big need that's before you. You take what you have, and you begin to work it and bless God and honor God with it. That's what I did. I've done that every juncture of my life. Just thank you, God. It may not be everything that I need, 
It may not be everything that I desire. It may not be everything that I want. But God, I honor you with what I have. And I will take my simple gift. I will take my simple whatever it be, the little bit that I have, and I will honor you and I will work it and 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 bless you and honor you. And just like you multiplied the fish and the loaves for the Lord, you will multiply what I offer up to you in faith and in worship and in thanksgiving. The impossible becomes possible when you start to do what is possible. And you know, the Bible goes on to say, they sat down, he starts breaking the bread, he takes the five loaves, the two fish, looks up to heaven, blesses it, broke the loaves, gave it to his disciple. As he's handing it out, it's just multiplying. As he's working what he has, it starts to multiply. It starts to meet the need. It's a miracle. And miracles still happen. And it can happen in your life as well when you take what you have and you bless God with it. And he said he broke it up, the two fish, and divided it among them all. Now, notice, they didn't get little fragments and little pieces of fish because the Bible says in verse 42, so they all ate and were filled. So it wasn't just little fragments of fish that they got, little crumb of bread and everybody. No, they got a good portion of fish and a good portion of bread. And it says that they all ate till they were full. And listen to what it says. After everybody got fed, it said in verse 43, they took up 12 full baskets of fragments and of the fish. 12. And those who had, been, had eaten and fed, were fed uh, were 5,000 men. And that's not counting the women and the children. So he took up 12 baskets. So I, 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 think, I don't think that was by mistake. I really don't. I think they took up 12 baskets of leftovers because there were 12 disciples that were with Jesus, his top men, and I think each of them went home with a doggy bag just as a reminder of what God will do when you just put your faith out there and trust him with what you have. Instead of complaining about what you don't have, thank God for what you do have. Amen. Offer it up to him, thank him, honor him with it, bless him with it, and see what God will do. Hallelujah. Put your hands together, give God the praise and the glory. Let's stand to our feet. Say this with me, say the impossible, the impossible. becomes possible when I do what is possible. Say it again. Say, the impossible, the impossible becomes possible when I do what is possible. One more time. Say, the impossible becomes possible when I do what is possible. Put your hands together and give God the praise and the glory. You do your part and God's going to do his part. Amen. You honor God and bless God with what you have. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and God will take what you have and multiply it into something more than you ever thought you could have. Amen. I have been doing the impossible all my life. I have been moving in the realms of the impossible all my life. You know how many churches in this area have come and gone in 35 years that we've been here, 36 years, I guess it is, that we've been here? I, can t I can't tell you how many have come and gone, never even really took off, started and closed. But yet we, not only did we survive, but we thrived in the midst of it. The impossible. Because I never solely trusted in my own ability. I never really trusted in so much of what I could do, but what God could do. What I did was said, Lord, I'll do what I can with what you've given me. And I will do the best with what you've given me. And Lord, I know that you will take what I offer up and what I give to you the work of my hands, my faith, taking, doing with whatever you've given me. 
to the best of my ability, honoring you. And I know, Lord, that you will take it and you will multiply it. And you know, they say, the old saying is, you know, the, 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 the truth, the fruit, you know, it's in the pudding. It's here. And God did it. God did it, and he will always do it. Because he's an awesome God. He's a powerful God. He's a compassionate God. He's a loving God. And he wants your faith. And he wants your trust. And he wants you to just stop looking at the negative and looking at the positive. Say, this day I'm strong. This day I'm well. This day I will live for you. This day I will honor you and I will work this day to the best of my ability, giving you honor, giving you praise and giving you worship. God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for giving me the strength for this day, the wisdom of this day, the knowledge for this day, God. I will work whatever you've given me, God, to the best of my ability. And watch and see what God will do. Watch and see the strength and the power and the might that will come upon you and upon all that you lay your hands to in Jesus' name. Glory to the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Every head bowed and every eye closed for a moment. If there be anyone under the sound of my voice today who has never for yourself received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you need to do so before you leave this place. This is where it all begins, by receiving and accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you would say, Pastor Ray, please in, include me in this prayer, helping me to receive Jesus. Just lift up your hand way high. Nobody's looking but me right now. Just say, include me. I'm not going to embarrass you. Thank you for that hand. I see that in the balcony. Is there anybody else? Just lift up. Thank you for that hand, second hand in the balcony. Anybody else down here? Yes, I, I see that hand. Thank you back there. I see it on the left. Anybody else? Any, thank you for that one. Yes, indeed. I want to give your heart. It all begins by giving your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not saved just because you were born into a Christian home or you got baptized as a baby or you go to church. That doesn't give you salvation. What gives you salvation is when you invite Jesus into your heart as an act of your will. And that's what we're going to do right now. Anybody else, if you're watching by internet, stay right where you are. Lift, just stay right where you are. Pray this prayer with me. All of you that lifted your hand today, pray this prayer. Everyone in the room is going to help you, but I want you to say these words like you mean it, like it's coming from your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus. And Jesus, I thank you for dying for me and shedding your blood for the forgiveness of my sins. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash me clean. Give me a brand new chance at life. From this day forward, I will follow you. I will serve you. I will love you with my whole heart, soul, and mind. From this day forward, I will call you my Lord, my Savior, my King, and my God. And in your precious name, Jesus, I pray amen and amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, yep, go ahead, you can put your hands together. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time and you lifted your hand, there's an usher nearby that wants to hand you a packet of some very important information to help you to understand what you have just done in accepting Jesus as Lord. If you did not get that packet as you step out, please get with any usher and they'll be happy to put it into your hands. If you're watching by internet, just follow the instructions on the screen. We want to get that packet to you as well. Praise God. Well, thank you for being here today. Thank you for being a, a, an attentive audience. I pray that you'll take what you've heard today and you'll put it into operation into your life and you'll begin to see. Everybody's got something. Everybody has a starting place. Take what you have, work it, honor God with it, and see what God will do in return. 
Come on, give, give the Lord a hand clap, a shout, and an amen. All right. I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I speak over your lives that this will be the best week of your life yet. No sicknesses, no diseases, no disasters, no bad news, I pray, is coming to you or yours. Only the good and perfect gifts that come from the Father of lights, I pray, will find their way into your life, to your home, to your children, to your children's children, and to everything that is connected to you. I speak over your lives that this week, no weapon formed against you will prosper, and you will refuse every tongue Refute every tongue that rises in judgment against you, for this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. I speak over your lives that this week, you'll be blessed in your going, blessed in your coming. Everywhere you go, you'll walk under the mighty hand of God's blessing, showing and proving yourselves to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. And above all else, I speak over your lives that everything, and I said everything, that you lay your hands to shall prosper in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe, receive it, shout amen. God bless you. We'll see you again next week.